Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today, I can't tell you how excited I am to have as my guest, Laura Trevelyan. She is a familiar face to many of us because of her years with the BBC, where she worked for 30 years as a correspondent and anchor. She has covered some of the most important news events of our time, from the Northern Ireland's Good Friday Agreement to the January 6th attacks on the U.S. Capitol. However, for me personally, what's exciting is that her work goes beyond journalism. And in February, she and her family went to the Caribbean island of Granada, where they actually apologized for their ancestors' role as slave owners. In March, Laura left the BBC and, in her words, joined the Caribbean fight for the repertory justice. In this exclusive interview, Laura shares insights into her career at the BBC, her advocacy work, and her involvement in the reparations movement, which is so critically important now. Laura Trevelyan, welcome to The Caring Economy. Thank you so much for the invite, Toby. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Laura, we always begin by asking our guests to give us sort of a digest of his, her, their life, maybe a two or three minute overview of where you're born, how you were raised, how you were sort of pivoted left to right when you did and uh, how you got where you got. So over to you. Oh, Toby, thank you. It's a great question. Well, I was born in 1968, uh, August the 21st. Actually, it was the day that the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. It was the end of the Prague Spring. And my mum always tells me how she was watching the newsreel footage uh, on the telly a few days later, because you remember how everything rolled in later in those days. So I was born in London. Uh, I was raised by a single mom, actually, my parents divorced when I was young. I'm the eldest of three siblings. Uh, I went to state schools or public schools we'd stay we'd say here in the United States in London to Bristol University and uh, then I went to postgraduate journalism school in Cardiff because I just absolutely loved current affairs I majored at Bristol University in politics I switched from reading English which I found a little bit dull I didn't really like the Beowulf of it all Toby and I became a journalist a local newspaper reporter in London after postgraduate journalism school at Cardiff University uh, and then I went to the BBC in 1993 and uh, started off as a researcher. Then I became an on-air correspondent. I wow. was a political correspondent during the Iraq war, uh, covering all those developments in Westminster. Came here to the United States in 2004 because my husband got a job here with ABC News. And so we haven't left 19 years later. And, uh, you know, I had a wonderful BBC career being the UN correspondent and anchor going all over the world. And then, as you were saying, in March, uh, I you know, shook it all up and left the BBC to join the Caribbean's fight for reparatory justice. Yeah, and you're shaking it up. When you were a young kid, What was that how early your interest in storytelling and journalism happened? Or was it at university or exposed to it? How did you kind of find that professional footing? Well, you know, Toby, when I was a child, I had a a newspaper that I typed on my typewriter <laughs> when I was 10 years old and it was called the Cantalows Gleaner. I lived on uh, Cantalows Road in Camden Town in North London and so I had a, a little newspaper that I wrote about comings and goings on my street. So <laughs> that was how it all began. I was a reporter from a young age and I think maybe in some ways being the oldest child of divorced parents I was always the person that was having to figure out what was going on and then communicate it to my siblings. So I definitely was always on the lookout for information <laughs> and trying to figure out which way the family was going to go. So maybe that's how it all began. But also my dad was a Labour councillor actually in Camden Town. So, you know, he was very interested in current events and he was also a civil servant. Uh, so I think there was a bit of that in it too. Then your husband you met, he's a Brit? Yes, we met at Cardiff University. We met at the postgraduate journalism school yes although we're all americans now and he uh, yeah was also a journalist and came here in 2004 to work for abc news and rose to become the president of the network uh, left, left in 2021 and set up his own production company and actually toby he produced the january 6 hearings last year james goldstone oh, oh. Right. actually i think i've seen some um news reporting with him uh, mm. that's awesome you're in journalism and you've covered some of the most important news events of our time so what's your style laura how did you figure your approach to covering these stories was it just standard practice good training in journalism that you learned in school or what stories did you cover and how did you define your own approach 
Well, I think, you know, the BBC is obviously public service journalism at its finest. And so the BBC tradition is to get to the heart of the story uh, with integrity, remembering that you should be always asking the obvious question that the audience wants you to ask, that you should be treating uh, anybody you meet in the course of covering a difficult story, whether it's a hurricane or a mass shooting or whatever it is, with with respect. Mm -hmm. So those are the the guiding principles, I think, really. And wherever I've been in the world, whether it's reporting on uh, camps for displaced people in Sudan, in Darfur, whether it's being in the Gaza Strip just after an Israeli Hamas offensive has ended, whether it's being in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in a situation that seems a little sticky. I, those are always, I would say, the principles that I've followed. Yeah, but tell our listeners who and our viewers who haven't walked in your shoes, how can you be objective and detach yourself from such emotionally charged situations as war zones and refugees and, and crises. It must be just an incredible Teflon coating that you have. Yeah, I think it's tricky. I mean, I've never been in what we would say a hot war zone, a shooting war, but I've certainly been in a lot of civil unrest. And I think an example I would give is being in Haiti after the earthquake Soon mm. after that, there was actually a cholera epidemic, if you can imagine, in that yep. Caribbean island, which has been through so much unrest. And I was there covering the cholera epidemic. And cholera is just one of those things where the treatment is actually quite straightforward. It's a drip. But if you don't get that drip treatment, you can die really quickly. And it was it was horrific to see what was happening in, in Haiti. And at one point, we were at a hospital covering the outbreak and a, and a woman who was very sick tried to give me her baby she, she wanted me oh. to take her baby Gosh. and at the time I had a baby of well a young child of my own my the youngest of my three sons was was small at that point and just as a mother to see another mother in such distress was was really heartbreaking actually mm. and it is it's hard to be objective and it's hard to check your emotions in those situations but that is also part of the story that, mm. that as a mother you can portray to, to viewers around the world the, the anguish in the hope that it will help bring the world's attention to what's happening how did that story end I, I presume you couldn't take the baby but do you know whatever happened no I the mother got better she got, she was online at that hospital waiting for the drip and she did get the drip. And so she did get better. So it wasn't the horrific scenario, but it, but at that moment, her desperation when she didn't know if she was going to get treated was so great that yeah. it was really, it was tough. So that sounds like a sort of a, a really low, so to speak, a dark point in news coverage. What are some of your more, do you have a really jubilant memory of something you covered as a journalist that always just... You know like Funny, funnily enough, there there are a few, and I here in the U.S. I've covered so many hurricanes and the aftermath of hurricanes and of flooding. And at one point, when I was in Houston, where it was just terrible, terrible flooding in the aftermath of a hurricane, there, you know, Houston is basically at, at sea level, and there's been all of this really quite uncontrolled development in the suburbs around Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I met people who had lost everything in the aftermath of flooding, but were so generous and just delighted to see reporters, as strange as it might see, seem, especially international reporters covering yeah. what had happened. And I'm just always so struck by, especially Americans, just how kind and welcoming people are even in the aftermath of a disaster and how generous they are and, and people wanting to show me their photographs of their ancestors that they've managed to actually retrieve from these houses that have been flooded. And so that kind of thing has always been really touching. And I'm always just so grateful that people can be so generous yeah. uh, to report when they're in the face of something that's so difficult. You know, that's actually, I think, I'm going to jump right into the reparations piece, because I think that I'd like to believe that when you see a victim in that situation sharing cherished memories of a the houses can be rebuilt, but those photos and what they represent cannot be. Um, 
how tell us a little bit about the work you're doing the history that, of your family how you got involved in reparations and um and what you're up to and then we'll come back to some more journalism stuff as well as more reparation stuff if you don't mind i'm just thrilled to hear your story yeah well it is a bit of a journey toby but in a way i think it represents the finest tradition of the bbc because um in 2022 the bbc let me go to do- to grenada to the caribbean island there to make a documentary um about the legacy of enslavement on Grenada because it was one of those Caribbean islands where the British kidnapped Africans in West Africa, took them to the Caribbean, forced them to work on sugarcane plantations for the profit of people back in Britain, including, it turns out, my ancestors, actually, the Trevelyan family, which this was something that my generation and the generation above knew nothing about until the compensation records were published in about 2013 of those families in Britain who received compensation when slavery was abolished in 1834, which might seem strange, Toby, to think that it was the slave owners who received compensation, but it was it was for what was termed the loss of their property. That was how the enslaved Africans were viewed. So I went to Grenada to make this BBC documentary last year at, with a young Haitian-American producer, Coralie Barreau, who was coming at it from a different perspective because she's a descendant of the enslaved, actually, in Haiti. And we went together on this journey and we were welcomed by Grenada's National Reparations Committee by Nicole Philip Dow and Arlie Gill, the chair. They were so welcoming to us, which you know I was pleased about because I wasn't sure how we'd be received. And actually, in general, on the island, people were very curious to meet a descendant of slave owners, but also wanting to have the conversation about what the legacy of enslavement is and and what does this mean, that something that was so unfair happened all these years ago and and what can we figure out about it today? And then after that documentary, Toby, and then after going with our family actually to Grenada to apologise in January, um, I was so overwhelmed by the reaction and so... Uh, talked a lot to Sir Hilary Beckles, the chair of CARICOM's Reparations Commission, to Nicole Philip Dow, and they encouraged me to think of myself as someone who could be a bridge between the Caribbean and between Britain and and to be a a voice for the Caribbean in this reparatory justice movement and in the Caribbean's ask of the former colonial powers for, for reparations, for investment in their health and education systems, for debt relief because of this legacy of enslavement and wealth extraction. And so that's that's what I'm doing now, Toby. Wow, what an eloquent and um, succinct summary. Um, a couple of questions. Do you, can you help our listeners understand, um, there, we're in this era where things are politicized and people say, well, that's woke behavior or why are you blaming my generation for things that, I mean, there's so many different ways to tease this out, but I would imagine you almost have a mantra at this point, Laura, about how you address, so to speak, naysayers. Is that a fair thing to say? How do you how do you help bridge those people who don't want to necessarily hear what you have to say? For sure. I mean, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, and yet at the same time, I think it's quite simple. Certainly the Caribbean side of it, uh, you know, slavery was abolished 190 years ago. But if you go to the Caribbean islands, today, you can still sense the legacy of enslavement. For example, uh, there is an, you know, an epidemic of diabetes and hypertension and obesity in the Caribbean, which scientists who have studied this would say is linked to the fact that the enslaved uh, mostly ate sugar on many of the islands. So if you have a very high sugar diet, then that will result even generations later in diabetes diabetes and hypertension and what I saw when I was in Grenada was Nicole Philip Dow the deputy chair of the reparations committee she wanted me to eat the national dish oil down which is a one pot dish that uh-huh. the enslaved made and it's based on pig's feet salted fish and coconut milk so really high in sugar and in salt and Nicole's point was that this is one of the legacies of enslavement is the poor health, which results yeah. from this bad diet, which is a direct le- a legacy of enslavement. So one of the reparations asks of the Caribbean islands from the former colonial powers like Britain is investment in healthcare because of this legacy of poor health. And so I absolutely for people who say, what is this to do with me 190 years later? Why should Britain pay? 
I would say, well, there is this legacy still. You know, it was a system of wealth extraction. Britain got everything. And the Caribbean was left with nothing. And is catching up today. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, again, today on The Caring Economy, we have as our guest, Laura Trevelyan. She is a veteran BBC reporter, anchor, and more recently, a real advocate for reparations movement um, in the aftermath of the legacy of slavery affecting not just North America, but also Europe and many parts of the world. Laura, can you help us? Uh, can you explain in your family's case, as I recall, you, you've made some very specific gestures around where you're going to focus your, your reparations. And it's very island specific, right? It's not back in the UK, so to speak. You do a lot of education work there, but you're focused on Granada, which is where the original enslavement happened. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. My ancestors owned at different times, part owned 10 different sugarcane plantations across Grenada. And it's a very small island, Toby, only about 120,000 people today. So Sir Hilary Beckles said to me, uh, not really in jest, he said, Laura, probably most people in Grenada at one point were owned by your ancestors. Their ancestors were owned by yours, which is wow. a tough way to think about it. But, you know, eight generations later, there has to be some truth in that. So what we did specifically and what I have done is to, uh, I'll be 55 in August and I'll be able to get my BBC pension. So I'm taking 25% of it in cash and I'm going to give it to uh, the University of the West Indies um, Education Fund, but bursaries for mature students in the University of the West Indies and also uh, some of the money will go to Grenade which is a rural charity that helps children with the cost of getting to school uh -huh. uh, and that's what where I want the money to go and it's going to be divvied up in consultation with the government of Grenada because one of the Caribbean's asks is that at um, emancipation illiteracy was one of the huge legacies of enslavement that the enslaved were poor and they were illiterate and so to invest in education that's something that the Caribbean governments are asking the former colonial powers to do and for us as a family it seemed like investment in education was very important yes great and also you know um, we often talk here in the states about just the the economic opportunity that was denied these folks, they, A, they were property, they couldn't own property. And then when they had property, we had things like, um, you know, like the, um, what is it in Tulsa, Oklahoma and Black Wall Street. And when people did build some wealth that was taken away. So I, I understand why you have to sit down with people and have a dialogue because it's not a quick answer, but there are ways forward. You're clearly demonstrating it. I just wonder for those who choose not to look at that or go there, how they, um, how it all ends for them. I mean, I'm, I must, I have to believe that you're feeling a certain sense of joy because you've gone there. You're not through it. It will never be fully done or corrected, but you're part of a solution that some, in my estimation, something that has to be addressed if we're ever to move forward in society. Well, I think that was what really came home to me from going to Grenada. And by the way, it's not like everybody said, oh, this is wonderful in Grenada. Thank you very much. There was a lot of anger and oh. there was a lot of, well, what's this going to do for me? This isn't very much money, is it? A hundred thousand pounds when your ancestors got millions in compensation. And by the way, how much did they even make from the sale of sugarcane? And I don't actually have an answer to that question. I don't know. All, all, the only figure that hard figure we have is is the millions that they got in today's money in compensation when slavery was abolished so it is difficult but at the same time there's a healing that comes i hope through acknowledgement yeah. and that also was something that i took from grenada is that one woman came up to me and said with your apology your family's apology for your ancestors enslaving ours i feel like a burden that i didn't even know i was carrying has been lifted wow. And that to me was very powerful and profound. And she could, she didn't exactly identify what the burden was even, but it was what Sir Hilary Beckles said to our family when he addressed us on a Zoom when we were debating this apology. He said, for so many people in the Caribbean, our history is a void. You know where you came from, but we don't. We just know that our ancestors were kidnapped from West Africa. So you, you actually are part of the history of the Caribbean, the descendants of slave owners. And if you come forward, that will be powerful and it will set an example and others will follow in your footsteps and it will be part of the healing. And we trusted him. And 
And I, I hope and I think that he was right because other families are now contacting me asking, how do we resolve our history? You know, our ancestors were slave owners in Jamaica, Barbados, Guyana. We want to try to figure it out. And what yeah. was your roadmap? Yeah. You know, I'm reminded uh, I ran communications at Christie's for 10 years globally, and there it was all about restitution of Nazi looted art because wow. it was similar to how data be information becomes available. You talked about the um, the the records that became available a few years back. And then when the wall fell in the in the east, that opened up archives and there was information that became available so that you could start to look at how were these things owned, what was the provenance, and then you have actual records to go back. And then there there are ways, right? It's not quick and easy, but there are ways we've seen with restitution and Nazi looted art. We've seen, as you're seeing now, with reparations. So I'd like to think that it's actually becoming, I don't know, a better science than it has been in the past. I think so. I, I think now so much that was swept under the rug for years, whether it was the Nazis theft of Jewish art or whether it was enslavement and just the extent to which so many families in Britain were involved and the extent to which Britain's economy in the 19th century was to some degree built off the wealth of slavery. Now these things are coming out into the open and they're being discussed in some ways only now as the past recedes, does it come into focus more clearly? And can we debate it with some distance? Do you, um, two questions, one about your sons and one about the US, UK. What's your, with the US, UK, what, can you compare and contrast what you're seeing in terms of the movement? Yeah, I mean, it's very different, isn't it? The first thing I'd say as an overview is that, by the way, American slavery is British slavery because <laughs> America was a British was colony it? when, yeah. slavery began here and it wasn't until 1776 that you Americans or we Americans I'm an American now too uh, rebelled and declared independence so it, it is a legacy of British slavery but the difference is that in Britain of course it was largely it was in the Caribbean it wasn't in people's homes really in the same way whereas here American slavery was in the cotton fields it was in people's homes yeah. You know, we live with descendants of the enslaved, cheap by jowl. It's not offshore and can't be ignored in the way that it was in Britain. So the legacies are, are different, I think. But what I find so interesting about the reparations debate here in the United States is, in a way, it's much more mature. So you have California has now set up a task force on reparations. It's going to shortly report whatever the recommendations are. They'll be debated and adopted or not by, by lawmakers, mm -hmm. whereas in Britain, you know, there was a proposal that was kicked around some years ago in some quarters for a, a royal commission on, on slavery and the legacies. But Britain is, is I think, quite a long way behind the states oh. in debating these matters. Because at the consulate, we've been doing a lot of things with uh, Oxford and the examination they did. And we've worked with the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. And there's a, a whole effort, a two-year effort to create a curriculum to teach the transatlantic slave history. And this is all built out of the Toussaint Louverture um, book that the uh, Balliol professor wrote. I forget his name. So I, I, it's interesting. I, I love that we're actually even aware that such things exist now because we, for all kinds of reasons, we weren't. historically. No, exactly. I, I don't know what you were taught, Toby, but I was taught in school that William Wilberforce was the great abolitionist in Britain and that Britain led the way in abolishing slavery, not that we participated uh, in it up to the hilt beforehand. It was yeah. really a question of emphasis. And I think that emphasis is now changing. Yeah. And interestingly enough, um, I didn't know until I started delving in deeper, but Frederick Douglass spent a couple of years in the UK um, fighting for abolition. And in fact, the newly refurbished public space, the meeting halls at the embassy in Washington, is called the North Star Hall is an homage to his abolitionist newspaper. And so we're trying wow. with programming there to bring in all kinds of diverse uh, stories and legacies and histories. So it's and in, technically he had two English women who bought his freedom, which is also and eventually he married. He married a second time to an English woman. So the more you go into this, the more fascinating it gets. Um, but what about your sons? What how are they how are they? Uh, engaging with this 
Well, you know, Toby, they're, two of them are in their 20s and in college. One's about to graduate, one's a, a rising senior, and the other one's in high school. And they've been very strict with me about their right to privacy. <laughs> they, you know, growing up, the children of journalists, they're very protective of, of their privacy. So I I have agreed to respect that, difficult as it is for me as a journalist. Well, but I will just say that they were um, extremely surprised, shall we say, when I left the BBC and told them that I was joining the Caribbean's fight for reparatory justice because they think that I'm the most unlikely social justice warrior and, in fact, that I'm a dinosaur. So I said, well, that's kind of the point, that I'm not what you would expect because... This is such a compelling story of moral justice and the need for moral justice uh, that it's it's not what you you boys think it is. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad you're having those kinds of conversations around the dining dining table. That in and of itself is so important. Look, I'm mindful of the time. I want to ask you a question I always ask my guests, and we've missed so much. You've got to come back, but. What is your advice? Do you have like a pearl of wisdom or some pearls of wisdom you give to either young professionals who are or young college students setting out in their careers or even people who are later in their careers, maybe disrupted or questioning their purpose? Any, what is sort of, do you have a mantra or pearls of wisdom you might share? Well, I think to the young, and I one of the things I loved about the BBC as I got older, of course, is how you become a bit of a den mother, because everybody comes to you. That's when you realise you're old, when everybody <laughs> wants your advice on whether it's how to juggle work and a career or, or whatever it is. So I think what I always say to the young is, you know, you've got to outwork everybody else. You just got to hustle. If you want to rise, journalism is a really competitive trade, but you also need to make as many friends as you can on the way up because there won't be any time on the way down. So, you know, be kind, be respectful, be humble, but hustle and work your tail off is, is what I always say to the young. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by the way, and if you're a woman, don't wait too long to have children or don't wait to start a family just it's never good there's never a good time to have a baby uh, and this is now true for for all genders as my children would say mom this is not just advice that you should be giving <laughs> young women this is and I think it's true to, but for women in particularly in particular fertility falls off a cliff at 35 so don't be that news widow yeah. who is 40 and and well, has delayed like, you know you there's no you just have to try to juggle everything and it never makes financial sense having children and going to work because of the <laughs> prohibitive cost of childcare. So you just have to do it. But then at the other sort of end of it, I guess at my age, the I'm nearly 55, that end of it, I would also say there's still time. What I've found is there's time for another, a second act. And actually you can take all of that experience and that wisdom that you've garnered over your 35 years in the workforce. And you know, you know more than you think. Uh, and especially if you've worked in daily news, you have all of these skills of synthesizing information, public speaking, delivering to deadline, delivering under pressure, which are good skills uh, for the next life and, and the next job. So, yeah, I think I would say if you can, in a, if you're in a position to, to give back at a later stage in your career, then go for it. Can you say a little bit more, though, because you've definitely sought the higher purpose and I'm having to believe I'm mm. projecting here, but, you know, hopefully we have the wisdom, the experience, the network, the self-awareness to actually think beyond ourselves. So in that second chapter, is it fair to say that most people probably hopefully rise to that point where they think what's the larger purpose piece like you've done with this reparations movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for sure. When I was 25, it wouldn't have occurred to me. <laughs> and I I probably wouldn't have thought it was a cause. You know, I was too busy trying to establish myself, too busy yeah. trying to rise up that greasy pole. But yeah, as you get older, you realize, well, gosh, there is a bit more to life. And I have uh, someone who's quite influential in my life who said, well, Laura, do you really want to just cover another presidential election along with the thousands of other people who are going to be doing that in America? Or do you want to be a principal and try to make a difference? And if you can be, you should. That right. is your moral duty. And I, so I just felt that with Grenada, here was something, a message that seemed to me so easy to communicate. Families like mine who benefited from slavery. And by the way, we don't have the money now, our family, but we have the social standing for sure and the sure. confidence. Yeah. You know, why do we think we have a right to exist in this world and, and be confident and 
and think yeah. that people are going to take us seriously. That, no doubt, is a, a legacy of social standing over the generations. Absolutely. So then to do to communicate that Grenada still feels the legacy of enslavement and that the Caribbean, the Britain's black debt, as Sir Hilary Beckles calls it, the chair of CARICOM's Reparations Commission, that that black debt should be repaid. If I'm in a position to amplify that message, then I, it's my duty. Amen. Well, thank you for sharing that here on The Caring Economy. I try to use this show for a platform in the same way, leveraging it for those kinds of initiatives that really are so purposeful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to again thank our guest today, Laura Trevelyan. She is the celebrated veteran, BBC anchor, reporter, and advocate for the reparations movement, which we're all going to become more knowledgeable about and help be the change. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Toby. It was a pleasure.